Usually, when a murder case goes cold for 31 years, it's a fairly safe bet to say it's never going to be solved. And that's because, by then, the chances of police falling upon any new leads are so small they may as well be non-existent. Thankfully, though, this isn't the reality in all situations. No, when it came to Jay Cook and Tanya Van Kulenborg, their killer would actually be caught decades after the fact. And what makes this one especially interesting is that it all happened as a result of a 23andMe-style genealogy report. This is Monsters. Jay Cook and Tanya Van Kulenborg hadn't been seeing each other for a long time by the time they decided to go on a work trip to Seattle together in November of 1987. But it was long enough that, at least on the part of Jay, he knew that he was in love. That was a big deal for the sonic British Columbia native as, with him having little else in the way of direction in life, it at least gave him a potential future to hold on to. When it came to his partner, though, she wasn't so sure about getting serious yet. Sure, she liked Jay, maybe even loved him, but the idea of her settling down wasn't something she was as keen on doing as it would mean giving up so many other things. Of course, it shouldn't come as a surprise she'd feel that way, though, because she'd always been something of a free spirit throughout her youth. The kind of girl who rebelled against the school system by wearing a men's tuxedo to prom. When she wasn't doing that, she was broadening her horizons by taking a trip across Europe with her best friend, Mae Robson someone she'd known since their days in the Brownies together. In fact, it was that trip to London and Paris prior to meeting Jay that convinced her she wanted to travel more after graduation. And in order to do so, it might be best not to be tied down to any one man. At one point, she didn't even want to wait until graduation. After returning from her vacation across the pond, she initially told her father, Bill, she wanted to drop out of school entirely in order to give herself more time to see the world. But while he would eventually talk her out of it, he wouldn't be able to talk her out of skipping college to achieve her goal. That said, in order to do so, she'd have to earn some money first, something she was in the process of doing by working part-time as both a dog walker and a waitress at the British-themed Vancouver City restaurant, Pickwick's. Meanwhile, Jay Cook was less confident in himself and his abilities to succeed in life as an adult. That was because, with him being 20 years old by the time 1987 rolled around, two years older than his future girlfriend, the fact that he still didn't have a solid idea what he wanted to do made him feel like something of a failure. Sure, it's pretty common for 20-year-olds to still be figuring themselves out. In fact, it's pretty common for 30-year-olds to be doing the same thing as well. But when someone is in that moment and they feel like time is passing them by, it's easy for them not to realize how much time they still have ahead and instead get bogged down with the present. But it wasn't like Jay was doing nothing. No, he and his two sisters had a strong work ethic installed in them from a young age by their father, Gordon. That was partially what led all three to start helping out with their father's business, Cook and Talbot Limited Heating Specialists, a small family-run company that installed furnaces. It wasn't what the young man wanted to be doing with his entire life going forward. In fact, recently he'd been considering pursuing a career in marine biology instead. But at least it was something to keep him occupied for the time being. And when he met Tanya through a mutual friend in July of that year, it made him feel less like someone who was wasting his time. Of course, it wasn't his job that attracted Tanya to Jay, though. It was his caring, responsible manner and his willingness to put himself out there for people. Even as far back as his school days, Jay had been known to be the sensible and reliable one of the group, as was the case when, at a high school party, he was the only one to notice when a friend had drank way too much and he got them to the hospital before they could succumb to alcohol poisoning. Not that he couldn't be wild whenever the time called for it, though. In fact, on one notable occasion, he gained infamy amongst his buddies for abandoning his job at a pizza parlor in order to cycle for three hours through torrential rain and deliver them an extra-large deluxe with everything. Had they asked for that? No, but he brought it along anyway, as it gave him the excuse he felt he needed to join the party they were taking part in. 
Basically, Jay was the kind of guy who was loved by everyone around him because he could be both the life of the party and the person relied upon to take things seriously whenever the situation called for it. So with that in mind, it's easy to see why Tanya took to him so readily, and why when, after only a few months of dating, he asked her to accompany him to Seattle for a work-related trip, she decided to accept his offer. She did attempt to get her best friend May to come along with them as the two were still fairly early in their relationship and she didn't want to risk things getting awkward at any point. Unfortunately for the recent high school graduate though, May had to decline as she was dealing with a bad flu. Later, after May had a chance to reflect on her near miss, she couldn't help but feel guilty about her refusal to accompany her friends across the border. The way she saw it, if she'd been there, the whole thing might have been avoided as the killer could very well have decided three people instead of two was too much for them to overpower. Of course, there's no way to confirm things would have actually played out that way in reality though. There's every possibility that if May was there, she'd have been murdered as well. That wouldn't help to ease her conscience much though as, over the years that followed, she frequently looked back on the morning of November 18th when the pair of young lovers left town in Jay's father's bronze 1977 Ford Club van. But why were they going to Seattle at all? What was this work-related task that required them to head down to the United States? Well, as it happened, Gordon Cook, Jay's father, needed to get a hold of a furnace for an upcoming job and his usual supplier in Vancouver didn't have what he wanted in stock. So looking for the closest place that did, he eventually discovered another supplier in Seattle just across the border. Given how much other work he had scheduled at the time, he wasn't able to drive down there himself as it would require an overnight stay. That was why he asked his son to do the job instead, with him offering Jay his van in order to travel there. And obviously, not wanting to go alone, Jay asked Tanya to accompany him. Feeling the need to make it as interesting an experience for his girlfriend as possible and knowing her love of seeing new places, he'd chosen to neglect the most common route to Seattle down Interstate 5, with him instead taking a more scenic path that began with them driving to nearby Victoria and from there getting a ferry across the water to Port Angeles, Washington. Then, once they'd done that and were safely in the U.S., the plan was for them to travel across 77 miles of turns, forks, and road changes across four different federal and state highways, each of which provided a nice amount of scenery for Tanya to enjoy and perhaps even take photographs with her Minolta 35mm camera. After that part of the journey was over and they'd finally reached Bremerton, they'd board another ferry which took them all the way to Seattle, their final destination. Sure, it might have seemed more complicated, but for as much as it involved changing highways and jumping on and off ferries, it was a fairly simple drive and not one either party had any concerns about taking part in. In fact, even with the added diversion, they still expected to make it to the supplier the following morning as planned. And as it happened, at least the first leg of their journey went off without a hitch. Something that was confirmed by the fact several crew members of the Black Ball MV Coho Ferry in Victoria Harbor later recalled seeing the pair boarding that day. Things would continue to go as well after they made it through customs and into the United States at 4 p.m. At least for a while, as after making a brief stop at a market in Port Angeles for some soda and snacks, they got back in the van and began the journey down the peninsula through some of Washington State's most densely yet sparsely populated terrain. A slight problem did occur not long after that because, despite the plan being for Jay to fork left onto Washington State 104 when the turnoff came, he accidentally missed it and as a result would be forced to carry on along Route 101 for a little while longer. Not that such an error was a complete disaster, of course. It just meant that they'd have to backtrack and add some extra time to their journey. The only reason it was relevant at all in hindsight was because a grocery store clerk in the small town of Hoodsport named Judy Stone remembered giving the couple directions for how to get back on their desired path when they came in later that evening, confirming they were still alive at that point. They were obviously still alive when they arrived at Ben's Deli in the nearby town of Allen not long after that. Even if a suspicious looking figure in a brown raincoat had apparently followed them out of the grocery store back in Hoodsport. They were still safe and sound when they made it to Bremerton at 10.16 p.m. and there purchased a ticket for the ferry to Seattle. Though it's there the trail runs cold as the last anyone would see of the young couple was when they were preparing to board. Did they actually get on the ferry and travel over to Seattle? Well, while it can't be confirmed they were on that particular boat once it took off, 
It is known Jay and Tanya must have made it across the water at some point in the evening, as the van would later be found there. That said, they obviously didn't get far once they arrived, as the following morning, the supplier of Jen's co-heating waited for hours for the pair to pick up their furnace, only for no one to show up. What was even more concerning was that, as the day went on, neither of them attempted to contact their families and explain what the delay was, something that was particularly strange in the case of Tanya. She was very close with her parents and was known to keep in touch with them no matter what. Sure, it was before the era of cell phones, so it wasn't as easy to stay connected as it would be nowadays. But even in spite of that, she'd always managed to do so in the past by using phone booths and other similar tactics. So, when the time for them to return home came and went and they were nowhere to be seen, panic set in for the Van Kulenborgs first. That was what led them to get in touch with the Cooks, a family they hadn't actually met in person before then. Unfortunately, though, the Cooks hadn't heard anything from their son either, and by now they were starting to grow concerned too. It was starting to look like something may have happened to the young couple down in Washington State, which at best had delayed them and at worst led to them being incapacitated. So, not wanting to waste any more time, the Van Kulenbergs went to the local Sonich Police Department the following morning on November 20th and reported both their daughter and Jay Cook as missing. Sadly, though, that wouldn't lead to a full-scale investigation being opened because, according to authorities at the time, no missing persons report could formally be filed for three days as there was no evidence that foul play had been involved in their disappearance. As far as the police were concerned, there was every chance the couple had chosen not to return home of their own free will, though what their reasons for doing so would be were unclear. I will continue to say this every time it comes up in an episode, but there are no laws that require any amount of time needs to pass before a missing person's case can be opened. It's actually better to do it sooner, as the chance of finding a legitimately missing person alive after 24 hours reduces greatly. Authorities telling family members to wait could very well be a death sentence to the missing person. The family had to wonder if Jay and Tanya had run off and gotten married. Had they decided to go on a spontaneous trip around America in order to temporarily satiate Tanya's wanderlust? It seemed unlikely, given they'd gone to America with a specific job to do, but in the eyes of the law, that was just as viable as having met an untimely end. At least it was up until three days had passed anyway. Still, while Bill Van Kulenborg understood that was the reality of the situation on account of him being a lawyer, it didn't mean he was willing to sit around and wait for bad news to come to his door over the course of the weekend. In lieu of the cops helping him and the cooks find their children, he decided to go do it himself. Unfortunately, though, doing so didn't yield any positive results, as Washington State was simply too vast and too covered with deep thickets and tangled foliage for him to realistically hope to see any sign of them. What he really needed was a better viewpoint, and so that's why he got a hold of both a helicopter and a pilot and attempted to carry out an air search. But even that wouldn't do much to help matters. In fact, all it did was leave him significantly out of pocket and no closer to knowing what had happened to his child. Honestly, the truth of the matter is Washington State is just too near perfect of a place for someone to go missing and never be found again, just as it was a perfect place for a killer to then disappear themselves. It was exactly why it had served as the stomping ground for the likes of Gary Ridgway, the Green River Killer, and even Ted Bundy for a period of time. That's right, the area is no stranger to serial killers, and Bill was all too aware of that. So, as he headed into Seattle and began putting up missing persons posters everywhere he could, he couldn't help but wonder if it was all in vain and some terrible fate had already befallen his daughter, though he did try his best to push that thought to the back of his mind whenever it arose. His attempts to maintain a positive mental attitude wouldn't matter for long, though, because, just a few days later on November 24th, a body was found on an embankment just off Parson Creek Road, a lonely stretch of space located in Skagit County just south of Bellingham. The body had been discovered by Vic Wald, a local man who enjoyed going on morning walks throughout the area, all while collecting both aluminum and plastic drink containers that he then recycled in order to make a bit of extra cash. Of course, once he discovered the corpse of a young girl that morning, he immediately abandoned his normal routine and contacted the Skagit County Sheriff's Office, leading Detectives David Willard and Jim Moore to show up on the scene soon after. Once they did, they quickly got to work trying to figure out what had happened, 
Had this been a case of someone slipping and falling down the embankment, or had something far more sinister happened? Sadly, the answer to that would soon be shown as, upon closer inspection of the body, it became apparent she was naked from the waist down, bound by the arms with zip ties, and that there was evidence in the form of both scratch marks and semen stains to suggest she'd been sexually assaulted. On top of that, her actual cause of death appeared to have been a gunshot wound to the back of the head, execution style. The amount of blood at the scene suggested she hadn't been killed there and had instead been moved to the location post-mortem. Eventually, Bill was called in to identify the body of his daughter. Once a positive ID was made, the police got to work pulling any files they had on known rapists and killers in the area, all in the hopes it would lead them towards a suspect. Meanwhile, a bartender at Essie's Tavern in Bellingham was out back taking a smoke break when he noticed a wallet and a set of keys lying on the ground. After investigating and seeing that the wallet belonged to a Tanya Van Kulenborg, he initially decided to place it behind the bar as lost property. Of course, once news of Tanya's death started to spread around, he quickly realized what he had was more than just a simple missing item, so he contacted the police and told them about his discovery, causing them to come over to the bar and do a further search of the area where they quickly found zip ties that matched the ones used on Tanya. That wasn't all they found there, though. While leaving the scene, one of the investigators also noticed a van that matched the description given by Bill Van Kulenborg of the one Jay had been driving. So, the team immediately went over to check it out, and when they did, they discovered the inside had been trashed and that it was covered in blood which belonged to both Tanya and Jay. While that may have at first seemed like a terrible piece of news, it was actually in some way a relief for Jay's family as prior to that he'd been considered a prime suspect in the murder of his girlfriend. Given he was still nowhere to be found, and considering the fact that according to statistics at the time, 55% of female murder victims died at the hands of a romantic partner, there was every reason to believe he'd been the perpetrator. Now that so much of his blood had been discovered in his van, though, it quickly became apparent he was another victim himself. So that left the key questions. Where was he? Was he still alive? And who had killed Tanya? As it happened, the last of those questions would be particularly difficult to answer as, despite the DNA of a third person being found in the van, it wasn't as simple as just using it to find the killer back in 1987. At that point in time, there was no national database to draw from, so if you wanted to match someone's DNA with a sample you'd found, you first had to come up with a suspect. To make matters even more difficult, that was also a time before cell phone tower records, facial recognition software, or even social media was available, meaning tracking down anyone was that much harder to do. But what of the first two questions? Where was Jay, and more importantly, was he still alive? Well, the answer to both of those would come on November 26th when a man named Scott Walker discovered a body while out on a hunting trip with friends in Snohomish County, just 50 miles from where Tanya had been discovered. If Tanya's death had been gruesome, Jay's was arguably even worse as both dog collars and twine were wrapped around his neck. Tissues and a pack of cigarettes were found shoved down his throat, suggesting he died of asphyxiation. On top of that, severe head wounds and blood stains all over his clothes made it look like he'd been beaten badly, possibly even tortured, and that it may have even been a personal attack. As to when his murder had come in relation to his girlfriend's, given the pair's van was found closer to her body than his, it would be argued that Jay was probably killed first, with the likelihood being the culprit had done so to get him out of the picture, leaving him free to assault Tanya without anyone standing in his way. Of course, that still left the ultimate question, who was the mystery killer? And unfortunately for the investigators at the time, any attempts to figure that out would prove to be fruitless. Even when anonymous letters were sent to both the Cook and Van Kulenborg families a month later, letters that purported to be from the killer themselves, the police were unable to use them to track down any solid suspects. The reality was, given the technology that was available to them at the time, solving the murders of Jay and Tanya was just too difficult for the authorities in Skagit and Snohomish County. That was what led to the case going cold soon after, a classification which it would maintain for the next 31 years. Not that there weren't further attempts to find a suspect during that three-decade-long period. In fact, at one point in 1989, an episode of Unsolved Mysteries aired that detailed the crime. 
In August of 2010, it briefly looked as though a breakthrough had finally been reached when, following a Canadian news story on the topic, an anonymous tip was sent to the police claiming they knew who'd written the gloating letters to the family. Sadly, though, that proved to be a dead end as the perpetrator behind those letters turned out to be nothing more than a homeless man from the Pacific Northwest who was looking to gain a bit of infamy. The way he was ruled out as a suspect ended up representing a big step forward in the case as it was through DNA testing it was determined that he had nothing to do with the crime. By that point, technology and science had progressed far enough that DNA testing was a lot easier to carry out. In fact, by then, a complete national DNA database had been created, theoretically meaning cold cases such as the Cook Van Kulenborg murder should have been that much simpler to solve. But while that did indeed make things easier, in the end, it wasn't the national database that led to the capture of the person behind such a brutal crime 31 years prior. Rather, it would be something completely out of the blue. Genetic genealogy. What is genetic genealogy? Well, it's the practice of taking a DNA sample from a person, usually through their saliva, and using it to trace their lineage back generations, providing them with a more complete family tree in the process. Given how relatively cheap it is to do, it was becoming increasingly popular with the general public through companies such as 23andMe. For as much as most viewed it as a bit of fun, a way to see where their origins lay and what different cultures they had in their blood, one woman named C.C. Moore saw a lot more potential in the idea. As far as she was concerned, genetic genealogy could be used to not only help people find missing relatives, but also to track down suspects in serious crimes, such as was the case with the chameleon killer. After having been abandoned at a Southern California playground in 1986 by what people assumed at the time was an abusive father, a young girl named Lisa spent years not knowing who her family was. That all changed in 2016, however, as it was then that, after taking a DNA test, Lisa was finally reunited with her grandfather, and in the process, she learned she'd been kidnapped when she was a child, right around the same time as her mother had been murdered. The man who'd abandoned her had been her abductor and not her father, something that came as a shock to everyone. After further investigation, it was determined that man was more than likely the chameleon killer, someone who died while behind bars six years prior. That case was something that greatly interested Jim Scharf, detective in the Snohomish County Cold Case Unit as, by that point, nestled amongst the many cases he was dealing with, lay the still unsolved murders of Jay Cook and Tanya Van Kulenborg. The detective decided to contact Parabon Nano Labs, a nearby company that dealt with cutting-edge DNA technology. The team there weren't allowed to use crime scene DNA to create a full genetic breakdown of the killer, but they were able to use a technology called Snapshot. What it could do was create a loose approximation of what the killer may have looked like based on a sample of their DNA. Sadly, though, despite the breakthrough, Detective Scharf still wasn't able to identify a solid suspect, so, unsure of what else to do, he decided to go public with the case by holding a press conference on April 11, 2018. He hoped the press conference would lead to further public tips coming in. While a full 130 tips were received as a result, most went nowhere. In fact, the only one that did hold any promise came from a bartender in Bellingham who claimed to have seen a similar-looking man back in his bar in November of 1987. That was interesting because it was around the same time and location as the murders had occurred. And that wasn't the only breakthrough in the case that was about to occur either, because elsewhere, C.C. Moore, the same woman who had helped to pin an additional murder and kidnapping charge on the chameleon killer post-mortem, had become aware of the situation and wanted to help. CC used GEDmatch, a public genealogy database intended to help people trace back their family trees, the very same database that had recently been used to find the Golden State Killer and bring him to justice. Now, it should be noted that there had been plenty of ethical concerns raised about the usage of such a database in solving the Golden State Killer case at the time, with many of the people who spoke up having valid points about whether or not private information was being used as the system had never been set up for such a purpose. Jedmatched were even forced to address that in a public statement they made over the days that followed the killer's capture. But ultimately, as long as they agreed to inform their customers going forward that their DNA might be used in police investigations, and then give them the opportunity to opt out if they wished, it was all deemed to be legal. 
With that settled, and with the ethics of using Jedmatch now a bit less fuzzy, CC was able to get to work using the technology to try and create a family tree of the mystery person who had evaded police for over three decades based on their DNA sample, a family tree that she hoped would help her narrow down their true identity. Pretty soon, she had identified two people who appeared to be relatives of the killer, with them likely being on the level of second cousins. And because they had different surnames, Talbot and Rustad, it meant if the point these two families merged could be figured out, it would give the investigation a direct genetic path to follow. Of course, before that could be done though, the merge point had to be discovered. And luckily, it didn't take long for that to happen as, with a little further digging by means of public records, newspaper archives, and funeral obituary sites, a woman named Patricia Talbot soon emerged. If you remember, Jay's father's business was Cook and Talbot Limited Heating Specialists, and the last name Talbot is only a coincidence. While she had been born Patricia Peters, her mother had gone by the maiden name of Blanche Rustad, meaning that was the point the two lines first interconnected with one another. But while Patricia was already dead at the time, an interview wasn't deemed necessary as the fact she'd had four children with her husband William Earl Talbot was already public knowledge. If the DNA of the killer contained genetic markers linking it to both the Talbot and Rustad families, and with the semen found at the scene indicating it was a male who committed the crime, it couldn't have been one of her three daughters. No, the only person who could feasibly have been the murderer was the lone son of Patricia and William, William Earl Talbot II. Armed with that knowledge, Cece sent the information to Detective Scharf to tell him that the killer had finally been identified after all of these years, and that he lived in Woodenville, Washington, just up the road from where Jay's body had been discovered. At least, they were 99.9% .9 sure the killer had been identified. To be 100% sure, a sample of William's DNA would have to be taken and matched to the DNA collected from the crime scene. That meant the next step was to get a sample of the suspect's DNA something that proved to be easier said than done. It turned out, after cutting himself off from his family and friends following his mother's death in 2015, he decided to pretty much live the life of a hermit, with him rarely being seen outside of his home or his work truck. It seemed like the loss of a parent had a major impact on William, but then it wasn't like he didn't have issues prior to that anyway. As far back as his childhood, he'd always been something of a contradiction. A smart kid who regularly failed at school, an angry, rebellious child always on the lookout for adult approval, a hard worker who turned into a slacker depending on which day of the week it was. He'd even shown early signs of concerning behavior consistent with that of a killer when, as a youth, he pushed a neighbor's cat down a well, presumably just to see what would happen to it. A few years after that, he also started developing an unhealthy sexual appetite when he at one point forced his younger sister down on her bed and began touching her in a way which made her feel very uncomfortable. While his mother would always brush incidents like that off as Bill being Bill, his father was not so quick to understand. In fact, at one point, not long after his son threatened to run him over with a car once he was old enough to drive, William Sr. threw Junior out of the house with that leading to him spending the latter part of his teenage years living in a trailer behind his family home. Of course, none of that is to say the lone Talbot's son was a complete outcast. No, he did have at least one friend, Mike Seat. And on top of that, he was also very close with his grandfather. It was his grandfather who regularly took him out camping in Washington State, something that gave him a good understanding of the land, including where a man could best carry out a murder if he needed to do it quietly. Not that murder was on his mind at that point in time, though. Being a teenage boy, pretty much all he could think about half the time was the opposite sex. Luckily for him, he would begin to find a bit more success with girls as he got older because by that point he'd learned how to manipulate them to get what he wanted. That did start to build an unhealthy idea in his mind as to what women were, with that being a little more than something that could be used and then discarded whenever the time came. So perhaps it should come as no surprise that in 1984, he was arrested for assaulting his sister Marlene, an incident that saw him be barred from entering his family home once more only a short while after he'd been welcomed back. Rather than be charged and possibly even imprisoned, William was made to pay a mere $150 fine. Yes, the consequences were low, and that no doubt further fueled the idea in the young man's head that he could pretty much do whatever he wanted and get away with it. 
As far as he likely saw it at that moment in time, in fact, he was the king of his own little world and held full power over everything around him. One thing he didn't hold power over, though, was life and death. That came into stark view on November 24, 1986, when his grandfather, the only family member he'd ever truly loved, passed away. Obviously, such a moment was devastating for William and led to a period of depression that was only worsened when he lost his job soon after, followed by his car giving up the ghost. When the murders took place, it would have been a year to the day after the death of the killer's grandfather, something that could either be a coincidence or a vital element in explaining why he did what he did. Either way, after the murders occurred, William appeared to change for the better, with that rather chillingly suggesting that killing two people was enough for him to get whatever pain he was suffering from off his chest. He went on to get back on good terms with his family, something that continued until he completely cut them off again 15 years later, along with his close friend Mike Seat, making it difficult for investigators to obtain a sample of his DNA. The way authorities ultimately got their sample was to stake out an area they knew he drove to as part of his job as a trucker. Then, once he showed up, they kept a careful eye out for anything he might leave behind that would have his DNA on it, something that eventually presented itself in the form of an empty coffee cup which fell out of his vehicle as he was re-entering it. The investigators on scene quickly grabbed the cup once he drove off and took it back to the lab for testing. Thankfully, it was that test that confirmed the DNA at the crime scene had indeed belonged to William Talbot, meaning they could now formally charge him with the murders of Jay Cook and Tanya Van Kulenborg. Of course, that came as a shock to some of the people who knew him. A few actually wrote letters to the police singing his praises. It appeared there were two very distinct sides to William, with one being far kinder towards his fellow man. As the trial date loomed, Detective Scharf grew more and more concerned that it would influence the jury and make it harder to score a conviction. That wasn't the only reason he was concerned about the upcoming court case, though, as by that point there were growing concerns about the validity of using genealogy tests at all when it came to solving crimes. Especially as a prior case, that of Sarah Yarborough in 2012 ended up coming up with a false positive and identifying the wrong person initially. So, as a result of that, it was argued by some that the use of such tests in criminal cases couldn't always be trusted because they were not designed for such a purpose. Their usage may very well still constitute a breach of personal privacy, even if disclaimers had been given to the customers. Realizing they had to have an airtight case if they wanted to win once the day came for trial, the prosecutor decided to focus on four key points when it came to building their argument that William was guilty with those points being the DNA evidence picked up at the crime scene, the genetic genealogy reports, a handprint that was found on the door handle of Jay's van which matched the defendant's, and interviews with a number of people who knew him. Of those interviews, none were more damning than the one given by Mike Seat, William's childhood friend, as he recalled seeing Jay's van parked outside the Talbot family home in the days following the murder, suggesting his buddy was most definitely involved in what took place. But while that appeared to confirm he'd indeed been in contact with the murdered couple, William's lawyers argued that still didn't prove he was the killer. In fact, even his semen, which was found on the scene, didn't confirm he had anything to do with the murders as far as they were concerned. The defense was claiming that the sex between William and Tanya had been consensual and that explained why his handprint was on the door handle too. What it didn't say with any degree of certainty though was that he had murdered them. There was quite simply nothing that could outright prove that, and if there was any reasonable doubt, then it meant he must be acquitted. In one fell swoop, it looked as if the defense had actually managed to sway the jury enough to win the case. Luckily, though, the prosecution had one final ace up their sleeve, and that was to ask the question, why wasn't Tanya wearing underwear when she died? If the sex had indeed been consensual, they argued, then surely she would have gotten dressed again before she died a few days later as the defense were now suggesting. After all, it wasn't exactly warm out in the wilderness of Washington State at that time of year, so if she was naked from the waist down, it proved she died pretty quickly after intercourse took place, and given there was no other person who could have reasonably been around at the time to carry out such an act, William Talbot had to have been the perpetrator. In the end, that was enough to convince the jury to deliver a guilty verdict, finally putting the decades-long cold case of the Cook Van Kulenborg murders to rest as the killer was given life in prison without the possibility of parole. 
or so it seemed anyway, because in one final twist on December 6, 2021, William Earl Talbot's conviction was actually overturned when his team were able to successfully argue one of the jurors had been biased against him on account of them having experienced domestic abuse in the past. Thankfully, however, that wouldn't be the end of the story, as a year later in December of 2022, the conviction was reinstated after it was pointed out the defense team had the opportunity to dismiss the juror in question if they had any concerns about her ability to be nonpartisan. As they hadn't done that, there were no legal grounds for William to get a new trial, meaning as it stands today, he remains behind bars. While this has provided some much-needed closure for both the Cook and Van Culenborg families, and it's taken a dangerous man off the streets for good, perhaps just as important is that the trial itself was able to set a legal precedent, one which meant going forward genetic genealogy was now going to be a new tool police had in their arsenal. And because of that, a lot of monsters who probably would have never gotten caught for their crimes before are now going to have their day of reckoning something you're going to hear a lot more about during this season. If you're a fan of true crime, hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss an episode. You can also hit like or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.